going to do is to take um, a while to go through the things that have happened in the past five years that are directly following from the strategic plan. So you can see how we got where we are and uh, how we've uh, um, let the plan be the guide. So, Ed. Another man. Thank you. All right. So we need to take just a few minutes to refresh your minds about the state of play when we started this. Uh, pre the legis legislation in 2012, um, Rutgers was treated as one university by its, by its members. Um, the campuses in Newark and in, uh, in Camden were run by provosts. Uh, and uh, there was a widespread uh, uh, misapprehension that all the campuses were part of an AAU university, um, which in fact was not the case from the point of view of the AAU. AAU has always nominated only one geographic location. And that's always been their position to say that. Anything. But we had to have a pretty extensive conversation about that within the university community. And it took a while to get our arms wrapped around that. And then the legislation, of course, created a fourth entity. And then it created four chancellors. We were, we're delighted to have our four chancellors. But that complicated the picture because the AAU designates campuses by chancellor. So we had to do a, a, a lot of work to create this mini system that we all accept now, uh, where we have uh, a separate university in Newark and in Camden, led by chancellors who are the CEOs of those operations, reporting to me as the president of this mini system. This is not unique in the country. There are others just like this. And then we have the AAU University, which aggregates RBHS and runs away into a single entity, both led by chancellors who were govern their units and report to me as president of the AA University. So that's the background for the strategic plan. And you really have to remember that we did a lot of talking about this, probably over 18 months to get to that point. Um, and each of the uh, communities in Newark and in Camden, as well as New Brunswick and RBHS, developed their own vision for their entities, how they saw their units um, and their universities growing and developing. Um, and uh, we're part of this entire process. So we did the strategic plan. This is the strategic plan. If you had the document out, you could follow through this. And everything I'm going to say is going to put to something in that plan. By definition, it has to do with many things that span the entire university. But because of the scale of the university and what happens here in New Brunswick and RBHS, there are some things which are unique uh, more to RBHS and New Brunswick. Um, but the plan itself was followed by chancellor-led unit plans. You've heard about these from each of our chancellors. When you go and you meet on their campuses, they report to you on progress to their strategic plan. So I'm going to focus on the overall strategic plan, um, and I'll ask the, the, uh, um, the, the uh, deference of the chancellors where I miss something in their own strategic plans, which they are uh, going to be telling you about. So let's just refresh ourselves. The aspiration that we all agreed to was to be broadly recognized as among the nation's leading public universities, very carefully chosen words, preeminent in research, excellent in teaching, and committed to the community. And then there were three areas that, that we carved out. One were a series of strategic priorities. We like to think of these as the columns that hold the whole thing up. Uh, building faculty excellence, transforming the student experience, uh, enhancing our public prominence and envisioning tomorrow's university. And underneath that were core foundation elements that had to be preserved or strengthened in order for all of this to work. And there were a whole bunch of initiatives <clears throat> in that area. And then there was a, a final area called integrating academic themes, which has to do with courses and institutes and centers that pulled together the ideas that we were talking about. Now, I'm not going to talk about the integrating academic themes at all. It's a topic for a separate conversation. Um, they're really faculty-driven courses that were given, a symposium that were held, um, and it would take me a, a separate half an hour to talk about that. But what I do want to do is to go through those middle elements, which is where our plan really focused on deliverables. So let's just start right in. The first one was um, building faculty excellence, the first strategic priority. Um, the first thing we said we were going to do was to build the faculty and invest 
in a strong focus area in key areas that we identified in the plan as areas that we wanted to grow in. And we have, since uh, the beginning of the plan over the last five years, recruited about 1,500 new full-time faculty. Um, you can see the graph in the lower left showing that. And the distribution of those faculty is in the upper right. Um, a lot of, of growth in the health professions, engineering and computer sciences, STEM fields that's between the health professions and the biological sciences. A continued commitment to the humanities, language and literature, um, and then other areas that we were uh, working on. So again, you could put that to the plan. We've also um, been uh, pushing hard for teaching evaluation for reappointment and appointment and developing career tracks for the NTT faculty and most recently in the negotiations for the PTLs. So I think we have been able to do that and redesign that. Um, we've also recognized that we need to recruit and retain outstanding thought leaders as we recruit faculty. And one of the limiting factors for us was the uh, paucity of named and endowed chairs. So we set as one of our goals, uh, changing that. Uh, we've more than doubled the number of externally funded uh, endowed chairs from 41 to 89. Um, we established through the president's strategic funds 30 new internally funded Henry Rutgers professors. Uh, and between the two of them, we have recruited about 70 faculty members who are currently on campus um, who are drawn from the best faculty around the world, uh, in addition to our very strong faculty that we recruit um, as a matter of course. Um, and then we have to promote them. We have to get the message out. Um, we have to recruit the best. We have to promote those that we already have internally. Uh, and we've been pushing to do that. Uh, between 19, uh, 2012 and now, uh, the number of um, uh, members of the National Academies on our faculty have gone from 34 to 54. And you can see on the right-hand side the number of global and national honors. We've had Alaska Award, uh, the Wolf Prize and the Tyler Prize, I think, are, are rightly considered to be Nobel Prize equivalents in their fields. Um, and uh, I just want to point out uh, uh, Greg Pardo down in Camden, who won the Pulitzer Prize for his poetry, that we're very proud of. The other thing we focused on in the plan was the commitment to diversity. Uh, and I committed $20 million uh, between, $22 million between uh, 1960 and uh, FY20, uh, and then extended that commitment this year to go to 24. It's the single largest commitment that we've made in the strategic funds. Um, we have a lower than we would like uh, percentage of underrepresented minorities on our faculty. And we want to do something about that. Um, the point to remember here is that uh, it is something that happens slowly. If we took 100% of our recruitments, 100% in a given year, and made them all underrepresented minorities, we would change this number by only about 1%. So it takes, it's going to take a decade to do that. But having said that, in New Brunswick, we've gone from 5.6 to 6.8%. Uh, RBHS from 5.4 to 7.1 just since 2016. So these are significant improvements. Uh, we've recruited, Barbara, how many of the have recruited under this program? About 50 or 60. 50 or 60, something like that, yeah. So um, the program is working well, uh, but it will take more time to achieve uh, the goals that we all set for ourselves. <coughs> Bringing faculty on board is the first step. You have to train them uh, and you have to give them the uh, opportunities to succeed. And we put in place a number of new programs uh, across the university in, in our individual um, uh, locations uh, with Nancy and Phoebe that pair faculty members up with mentors uh, that focus on career advancement, especially for female faculty uh, and uh, how we generate early career excellence in the faculty. So when we bring a faculty member in, we want them to succeed. And sometimes when you're recruiting uh, a minority faculty, it's a, it's a, sleep, a steeper slope and we have to make sure that we help them up that slope before it goes time for tenure. Okay, let's move on to the second major uh, pillar, if you will, uh, the strategic priority of transforming the student experience. Here we have a lot of ideas and a lot of goals that we set for ourselves. Um, the first was to establish the tradition of honors colleges uh, on our three campuses. Um, and uh, we have done that. Uh, the Honors College in New Brunswick, you know about. Um, I've spoken 
to you many times about this. Uh, we had our first graduating class from the Honors College this year. Um, it has certainly uh, exceeded our expectation in terms of demand uh, and in terms of the quality of the students that we've been able to bring on board. And so now we have a steady state of about 2,000 students um, who are at Rutgers um, and eventually moving through and graduating who are in this program who probably would not have been at Rutgers and probably not stayed in New Jersey if we didn't have uh, the Honors College. Um, Nancy Kander in Newark has a wonderful program that is a different take on an Honors College that looks not strictly at input metrics of SATs and things like that, um, but uses non-traditional metrics. A huge amount of labor goes into screening and interviewing and choosing students for this um, that is up and running um, and will really come alive this fall with the opening of their new Honors Living and Learning community in Newark uh, that has a residential capacity for about 400 students. And uh, Nancy told us last week, or two weeks ago now, uh, about the wonderful gift that she was able to uh, orchestrate for Prudential for $10 million to endow the scholarships that will help to make this possible. Um, in Camden, there is also an honors program. It's a much smaller uh, unit. Um, it's been there for quite a while, and that uh, uh, Chancellor Haddon has been expanding as well. So what else have we done that we said we were going to do? First, we looked at how we deliver information. <clears throat> we decided that we have to move information in on students. If we're going to do this, we uh, put together uh, a committee to work on that, develop a new approach to uh, in campus and between campus distance learning, which are these telepresence classrooms that come in two flavors. One that will handle 150 students at each site, 300 students for a lecture, and the other that will handle maybe 60 students at each site. Um, and uh, we have a number of these already in place that are listed there. I won't go through them for you. But what you see on the right, on the top is one of the big classrooms where all the students can see each other. The, the uh, lecturer is actually looking at the other class on the back wall, so she also can see everyone. The, the second picture is a smaller classroom where you can see two semicircles the, with the teacher in the middle, and everybody in both locations can see each other. We have big ones going between locations on uh, the New Brunswick campus and between New Brunswick and Camden. We have smaller ones between the two law schools, um, and uh, another one coming up in RBHS. So this is, a, I think, a home run for us. They were completely occupied from the first day. Uh, the student and faculty acceptances were quite high. Uh, we've also put in place active learning classrooms, which changed the, uh, the perception of education from our students from being passive, where they're just sitting in a lecture. In these classrooms, uh, the students all have access to computer screens and to the internet. Um, they're working in real time to answer questions, solve problems, exchange information. Their information is being shown to everyone else around the room, shown to them on these screens. They can interact, develop um, uh, viewpoints and proposals in real time. Very collaborative, very facilitated. We have eight of these new active learning classrooms and lecture halls now in place uh, and we'll be building more. Next is making it easier to be a student at Rutgers. This is the old Argus crew issue that we've dealt with uh, in the past, um, even at our graduation uh, and commencement speech, we heard about that. Um, but we have been doing things that, again, cut across the entire Rutgers the State University. So a single common learning management system for everyone that unifies the student experience instead of four or five as we've been running up until now. Um, a coordinated course scheduling system. So we've been working for three years on getting a computer-driven course scheduling system. This is not just for New Brunswick, it's for Camden and Newark as well. Um, and that is moving towards its first official uh, online scheduling um, in, uh, in another semester. So we're running through the third iteration of shadowing just to make sure everything is right and that'll go live. And the whole point here is not just to shorten transit time on buses, although that will certainly happen. It's a short of the time to degree to make sure that students can get the courses they need to graduate in a timely fashion, um, and they don't have extensions of a semester for a year because they were locked out of a particular sequence. Um, that's where we're going with this. And we've made significant investments in our bus system, uh, mostly in Newark and in Brunswick, because we don't have much in the way of buses down in, uh, in Camden. Uh, 
Um, the student services has always been a problem here, going to multiple locations to solve your problems with housing, um, with uh, finances, with student aid. Um, we've kind of tunneled through that barrier by creating a dashboard and a virtual one-stop shop for students on all of our locations to utilize where they have access to all of their information, whether it's course scheduling or their bursar's bill or their access to financial aid, and they can carry out transactions uh, on that portal. It's now used by 98% of our students, and it's taken 6 million hits in the first 10 months of use. So it's amazing how quickly the students have, have adopted and adapted to this process. It's what they do every day, to the extent that we're actually rethinking about the need for physical one-stop shops, exactly how much we have to invest in them, because um, Michelle and her team have put this together and it's working so wonderfully. More students on campus, um, as you know, means more students with mental health challenges that we have to deal with um, here, and an increasing demand for services. Uh, we've been very concerned about that. We've had a bunch of, of campus-wide, university-wide um, discussions and programs but we also invested dollars in this, um, increased by a third the number of counselor positions in New Brunswick, um, the number of referrals down in Newark, and their care team has gone up from less than 100 to over 300, and Camden has been able to increase their uh, walk-in hours threefold with additional staffing. So we take this very seriously, the problem that all of our universities are facing, but it's one in our strategic plan that we said we were going to address, uh, and we're working hard to do that. Um, we also said in the strategic plan that we would retain our commitment to access and affordability. And as you can see from this slide, we're talking about students with family income less than $48,000. That in New Brunswick, those students pay on average $268 towards tuition fees. Um, and in Newark and Camden, those things are entirely covered by the various grants that they get um, as, a, as a function of coming to Rutgers. So, we do have a high tuition, a high discount uh, business model here. The tuition sounds high, uh, but our commitment has always been to make sure that it's affordable for the students who need it most in terms of the affordability. And we made good on that by keeping the uh, annual compound average growth rate in tuition um, to 2.3% between 2013 and 18. It was running around 4% between 2007 and 2008. Having these students on campus means, just like faculty, the need for more support. So whether it's the work that Nancy and Phoebe have been doing with Run to the Top and Bridging the Gap, our EOF funding, Rutgers Future Scholars, RU First, um, we're bringing on <coughs> campus students that by definition will need more support, academically, socially. And the campuses are doing that. They're providing that support services. There's Dick Edwards with a group of them. Uh, Paul Ropes and Leadership Institute scholars. Um, the net result is on the following slide. Uh, if you look at the students at Rutgers who are Pell Grant recipients, they're the students who are most likely to need help, the ones that are most likely to be challenged, and the ones that are most likely to fail. So one of the metrics that we use is to look at the delta, the difference between um, the graduation rate of our Pell Grant students and the graduation rate of our regular students, and that's shown here. And what you can see here is how we stack up with that number compared to the Big Ten. And the bottom line is that we lead the Big Ten um, by a big margin. Um, so that the delta is only 5% between our Pell and our non-Pell graduation rate uh, students. And I should point out that um, this happens to be in New Brunswick because we only have comparison data for uh, for the AAU Big Ten people. Uh, our graduation rate here is right up in the upper third of that pool. It's not because we're not graduating kids. Uh, it's that we're graduating them successfully. And the other number that you really need to pay attention to is this one, and that is one that shows up in U.S. News and World Report now, uh, and it's the ratio between the actual and predicted six-year graduation rates for our students. Um, looks at their backgrounds, their educational backgrounds, socioeconomic background, predicts what their graduation rates should be, and then looks at how much worse or better we do. And you can 
you see that in New Brunswick, we are 8.4% uh, better than predicted, um, and our peers are down around 4%. In Newark, they're 14% better, and their peers are minus 4. And Camden is doing 1.7% better with a very difficult, uh, challenging group of students. So we're, we're doing a great job of doing a better job of graduating our students, educating them and graduating them than you would predict based on their, uh, their uh, characteristics when they come into the university. Okay, so let's move on to the next pillar and talk about things that have been done uh, in conjunction with the strategic plan to enhance our public prominence. Uh, I always said when I came here that this was one of the best kept secrets that I've ever seen. I grew up 50 miles from here, and I hardly ever heard anything about Rutgers. Well, that had changed. So we have a whole list of things in the strategic plan to address this. Um, <clears throat> we are fortunate in having the uh, 250th anniversary celebration fall in this time period. So one of our major goals was to use that 250 uh, to get the word out. And there's a whole list of things on the left-hand side that we did in conjunction with it. Um, very successful. In, uh, in actually making people aware. There's one of them right there uh, with uh, the Empire State Building spotlight on our, uh, our special day. Um, and of course, commencement uh, was a great one when we have uh, 45,000 uh, students and guests and one U.S. president, and he states in the speech that America converges here. And we were able to take that message, play it out in the media, We've got lots of press on this, um, and it was one that we were really, really pretty happy about. Um, so that's another way of, of getting the message out there and making it public. We undertook an effort to rebrand the university. And part of that rebranding was to create a shield. And most people take this for granted now. Uh, but this shield was there five years ago. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, made up of the various elements that characterize the university. But it really fits very well now with the other major Ivy League and, and uh, top-ranked AAU universities, if you see it um, on a screen. It's now on all of our material, taking the message out there. The other area that we've been pushing is to be part of the national discussion, right? to be part of the discussion. Many issues in the last five years that have come up um, that have captured the headlines across the country. Now, the, the problem here is in dealing with these issues, having substantive discussions, having major on-campus um, events, but not letting it bubble over, not letting it blow up, not letting the campus um, burst into flames. And so we have been very carefully trying to uh, walk that line, pushing very hard on First Amendment rights. Um, you can see the numbers of letters that we put down for the, uh, the Dreamers uh, participating and some of the women's issues and the diversity issues throughout this five years. And I could go into a long list of events that have, uh, have gotten us out there. A lot of press <coughs> picked up nationally, recognized as one of the national leaders in these things. But the thing that makes me the proudest is that we can have events like you see down at the bottom with the turnouts that we have. Um, and we have not had the kind of uh, bad outcomes that could have occurred. And I think that's because our students are used to talking to each other. They're used to having conversations because our faculty and staff are really well aware of what we have to do um, and our administration and our, um, and our uh, security services understand what, uh, what and how to make sure that um, a safe and civil environment uh, is maintained. We've also been pushing our student activity. Uh, we've had a great year, five years here. You look at what's happened. Uh, I have to uh, give kudos to Art Casciato, who handles our scholarship programs. Uh, ten Fulbrights, uh, top, I'm sorry, we're one of the top Fulbright producers in, uh, for ten years in a row, way more than ten. Um, Eleven Gates Cambridge Scholars in 12 years, and you can see the list. But the other thing that I'm really very proud of are the groups of students who have won national or international global competitions on academic subjects, whether it's the College Fed Challenge, um, or is the whole Prize for Social Entrepreneurship, the CME Trading Challenge, and you look at these students. But these are the ones that we got out there, full page ad in the Wall Street Journal. This is Rutgers. This is the diversity that we have here. 
So we can celebrate it, we can be proud of it, and we can make sure that everyone else knows about it. And I think that that is something that we've been able to do. Athletics is part of that. Uh, for better or worse, it is part of what we do. Uh, we're now in the Big Ten. We'll be full equity partners in 2021 FY, that's next year. Um, and uh, we had a pretty good year this year with nationally ranked teams in wrestling, women's soccer, men's lacrosse, field hockey, uh, et cetera. Um, and I'm particularly pleased that Sports Illustrated uh, rated Rutgers basketball as the most improved D1 team in the country out of 460 odd schools that were ranked. That's not to say that this is just an issue for New Brunswick. Um, you need to be aware of the fact that in Newark and in Camden, we run athletics programs. Camden had two All-Americans this year in track, and they've been conference champions in golf for eight or less, 11 years. And in Newark, the women's basketball team won the 2019 NJAC championship, and the men's soccer is nationally ranked. So these are all things that bring Rutgers into public prominence. And continuing to do that while we run a clean program uh, and we, uh, we do our best to be uh, in compliance on all areas uh, has been a, a challenge that we set for ourselves and one that I think we're, we're achieving. Uh, the other thing we have to do is to make people aware of the impact that Rutgers have. One of the things, again, you've seen this, um, that we uh, commissioned was an economic impact statement for Rutgers on the Garden State. This has gone out to everybody that I can find in the mailing list, right? especially all of our legislators, um, showing them the annual impact of five plus billion dollars on the economy of the state from Rutgers. And the fact that they get about a seven to one return on every dollar that they invest in the state um, in economic drive for the state. Uh, here's what I'm not sure that you appreciate. This is what uh, Pete McDonough and Kim Manning have been doing over the past couple of years. We didn't have much of a presence on social media. And the, on the left-hand side shows you the number of followers that we had on our main social media channels. In 2014, 50,000. 2018, 600,000. 600,000. Positive sentiment went from the low ace to 9.5. You guys that do sentiment ratings in your businesses know that's hard to do. That's pretty hard to do. The one I really like, you get the drops every day, and the drops keep getting longer and longer, the news drops. Um, 2014, they'd already been doing this, but we were about a quarter of a million. Um, this year, last year, uh, we were over almost 600,000 um, uh, drops uh, that cited Rutgers. So and even if it's just a mention of a Rutgers faculty member, the point is they're mentioning a Rutgers faculty member, and they're citing them by Rutgers, which is that's the kind of, of public um, uh, uh, impression that you need to get the word out. And I think it's also happened through Pete's work with government affairs uh, in terms of how we interact with our uh, governors and the Senate and the Assembly, um, being seen as a trusted partner rather than a problem child. Being seen as a place to go for a solution, <clears throat> and um, that happens on both sides of whatever political issue you should have to be coming out. Um, and it really is characterized by the increased number of contacts that Pete's team makes down there. They're down there all the time. They're in those offices all the time. So they are the go-to people when these conversations take place. And it's reflected in the national rankings. It takes some time. It takes a while, probably five to ten years. But as you know, uh, between 2016 and 2018, Rutgers and Brunswick moved up 14 points in the U.S. News and World Report. Uh, Rutgers Newark went up 18 points in U.S. News and World Report. Camden is 28th among regional institutions. And I, I won't go through the list here of the number of programs that are ranked at the top, but we're starting to see the results of what we said we were going to do in the strategic plan. That's why we were doing it, right? to make sure that people recognize us uh, as being in that position. So let's go on to the next pillar, which is the strategic priority in envisioning tomorrow's university. Of course, the first part of that that occupied a major part of the strategic plan was bringing uh, UMD and J into Rutgers. Um, and this was where uh, Chris Malloy, in his old role, was running the integration office for us and uh, did a yeoman's job to get this to happen on time on day one in July 2013. Um, and um, we are now ranked nationally in the 
top one to three uh, undergraduate health professions education programs. It's gone from one to three to two, but it's two this year. That's pretty remarkable, considering that five years ago we didn't have any, right? And now we're right up there. So a major, I think a major plus. And under Brian Strong, uh, RPHS has been evolving. Um, I just want to point out the number of leaders at the national level that Brian and his team have recruited in to head our major programs, our schools, our departments, um, our centers and institutes in health sciences. Um, he's been able to eliminate the deficit that we assume from UNDNJ. Um, and just this year, renewing the Cancer Center grant for $15 million, and really big deal, the, the CTSA grant for $27 million. These are things that put us on the map for research in the biomedical and health sciences. Um, on the clinical side, Brian has been able to form Rutgers Health, the first step along the way of, of making this a going operation, which is an integrated multi-specialty group product um, uh, practice with over a thousand providers. And again, put it in perspective, four years ago, five years ago, we had no patient visits. Last year, we did over 2.1 million patient visits at Rutgers and growing. And of course, that all allowed us to take the next step which was to sign the master affiliation agreement last year with RWJ Barnabas to form this health partnership, which I think is one of the biggest transformational events that Rutgers has seen uh, in terms of moving us forward in the future. You know the key elements, $100 million coming as an initial investment to Rutgers, uh, <clears throat> and uh, an additional probably $50 million per year support over the next 20 years. Brian's capability now is to recruit more than 100 research faculty, uh, which will more than double our RBHS research portfolio, which is one of our strategic goals. And we have to drive the funding for research. I didn't even put that on here as a slide, but remember, five years ago, we were at $350 million in research expenditure. This year, we're over $750 million in research expenditure. And those are the dollars that make it possible to pay the bills for our buildings and our faculty and everything else, but also the things that drive our ranking. So this is critically important for us. We've also been looking at restructuring other areas. We've made three big mergers, the School of Graduate Studies. Uh, we had two before. We've now merged into a single one. You know about the law school between Newark and Camden. That merger allowed us to jump from 92nd to 62nd just by virtue of the merger. Now, they drifted upward a little bit since then. Um, the nursing schools, the same thing between New Brunswick and Newark, from 79th to 20th nationally, again, by virtue of the combined numbers and quality of the programs. We also put together two faculty committees to look at um, future areas where we might consider uh, different academic organizations. They come up with a list of possibilities. They've been passed over to the chancellors um, who are now chewing on these, uh, and we'll see which ones then we can take forward. And finally, in terms of visioning tomorrow's university, remember when I first came, there was a big push for a campus in China, and that was something that I killed. I, know was, I didn't think it was the right time. The business plan didn't work, um, and it would have been financially very unfavorable. Un but now it's time for us to get out there again in ways that are suitable for the university, that have uh, visibility, that have impact, but are not exposing us financially. Um, the two that have come on board recently, the first is our big program uh, with the Yarkos Foundation in Greece, $27 million initial grant uh, that's often running, uh, running largely out of steps. Uh, and most recently, the Mahuve partnership uh, with Botswana, uh, which is um, one that I was able to put together. This is uh, President De Sisi with me at the football game uh, last year. Uh, the day that we kind of put our heads together and decided to do this. A broad-based partnership between the entire university and the entire Republic of Botswana, signed by the two presidents. So this is something that hasn't been done before. Uh, we are making some real progress there, but we're not hugely exposed from a, from a financial point of view. Okay, so let's move on to what I think is probably the least exciting but most important part of what we've been able to do that's building a foundation for success, uh, the fourth pillar from there. Um, first, of course, is recruiting a team of strong senior administrators. And 
Um, most of them are in the room here. I'm not embarrassed everybody by naming them. But with the exception of a few old timers, Tony, uh, Lynn, uh, 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 <laughs> virtually everybody was recruited to Rutgers because they saw the opportunity here. Because they saw the opportunity to make change. And I think, frankly, we have one of the strongest teams of chancellors and senior administrators anywhere in the country. Anywhere in the country. And uh, one of the things that makes my job so easy is that they don't need me to do the things that the university needs to do. Um, they're all excellent and uh, experienced and uh, fully capable of, of learning their components of the university and in working together as a team, which is the way the SLT works. Um, <clears throat> We move very aggressively <coughs> towards a, a data-driven management structure. Again, I'm not going to go through all this with you, but you know this. Uh, we've gone to responsibility center management. Uh, we've shifted almost everyone. Everyone on the senior leadership team is now compensated, at least in part, on performance-based compensation based on goals that they agree to and that we can measure. <coughs> we have dashboard metrics that um, you see on a regular basis. Uh, we have the same thing now with our research metrics. Mike and his team have put together an internal bank, <coughs> which allows us to do things uh, that we couldn't do before, and we restructured our debt portfolio. Uh, on the, uh, go, the philanthropy uh, uh, arena, we had a capital campaign underway when I came. That was not even three quarters of the way home, uh, with just a couple years left to go. Uh, we were able to restructure our fundraising, um, bringing Neville on board. He did a wonderful job of, of restamping and rebuilding our fundraising uh, uh, foundation. We're able to hit the $1 billion target on time um, and uh, on target. Uh, and you can see the areas that were supported with big chunks going for faculty and research and for students and learning exactly where we needed it on our, on our um, strategic plan. But the real numbers are here. Usually after a capital campaign, we really push hard, 13, 14, and 15 to get there, you see things kind of slump down and level off. Well, that's not what we've been doing. We've been continuing to grow the enterprise over the last five years um, with uh, new records in um, in almost every year except for that one year after the close in 16. Um, we'll hit uh, 243 million, it could even be higher than that as of this July. The point I want to make here is this. In the last five years, we've raised more than a billion dollars. And that exceeds all the gifts and pledges in the entire prior campaign, which was a seven-year campaign with a reach back of several years. So we are in a new place when it comes to fundraising. The goal now is to make sure we stay there and keep growing in terms of fundraising. But a big uh, hand for Neville and his team, and for all the people, including the chancellors and the faculty and the folks on their uh, teams for making this happen. And the result is here. This is the growth of our endowment compared to the Big Ten uh, group. And you can see that we rank number two in the Big Ten in terms of the growth of our endowment. So our endowment hasn't grown just because the stock market's gone up. And as, as much as I'd like to say it's because of our excellent investment committee, um, that ain't the answer. Right? That's given us about a 5% return. But the rest of that is money raised and put in the endowment. So we are way ahead of the power curve here in terms of real growth of the endowment uh, compared to our peers. I think that's something that you should be proud of. Um, and this is reflected by our assessments. Again, not going into detail, but this huge crowd on the bottom is Mike's team in finance, and they do a spectacular job of building, uh, uh, you didn't see that, they are your team, right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, And uh, building the, the message and the business plan and delivering so that we can maintain our A3, A plus rating at a time when the state has consistently gone through two down rates since I got here. Um, and that, I think, is a tribute to what the team has been able to do. The other issue that we addressed in the strategic plan was managing risk. Uh, we walked into some major issues with risk in athletics. Uh, we followed that with a few other ones, and we realized we had to do something about it. I think uh, with Tim coming on board and heading our compliance office and our, our enterprise risk management office, we now have um, a program that people
people come to look at. How do you do this? How do you get it done? With our um, enterprise risk management councils at each level that roll up that are constantly refreshed with um, risk mitigation plans and risk managers to own those plans. Um, and I think we are a much, much stronger place than we were before, not to be like William Sound. Right? So the, the message here is speak out. Let's make sure we understand it's not eliminate risk. That we can't do. If you eliminate risk, you don't grow, you don't do anything. But you manage risk. You have to know where it is. You have to take all possible precautions. And you have to know what you're going to do if something happens in that area. This is a biggie. It's two slides. It's boring. Um, it's, it makes people's eyes glaze over. This is a biggie. So in the last five years, uh, we have basically changed out the entire administrative infrastructure of the university. And that's a very fast time frame. Um, it hasn't been without its hiccups. Um, it hasn't been easy because making this much change in this little period of time um, certainly um, it is, it, it is not the easiest thing to do when you're dragging everybody along with you. But um, if you just look where we were in 2014 and where we are now, just to give you a point, 2012 when I came, we couldn't close the budget at the end of the year. It took us two or three months to get a budget closed. We are now to the point where, like most good businesses, we can close our books by the 15th of the month every month. We know where we are. And we finally know after hand work going through 12,000 grants one by one to identify where the errors were and get them back online, we now know exactly what we're doing every month by the 15th of the month, not only for the number of grants and the dollars, the number of submissions, which school, which department, and which faculty. So this is a totally different organization from the infrastructure. We have a procurement system now that enables us to do value-based sourcing uh, with our rebates uh, and volume discounts. And uh, the other thing I just point out, we had 200 distinct email systems back in 2012. We have one now. So I'm really proud of what the team has done here. We paid a lot of grief for this, but this is a different place. Uh, I'd like to say we could have done it slower, but frankly, uh, you can't make progress unless these things are done. And I think you're, you're most of the way through this now. Mike was having to say part of the way through this. Mm -hmm. okay. um, the other area where we have these major overhauls is in the student-related systems. I mentioned the course scheduling. Um, I mentioned the student services and the learning system. All critical to a successful or functioning university. And then there's the physical environment. And I'm going to whip through these very quickly. Um, simply to say the first thing that we needed to do was to have a vision for what the campus should look like. So we put together um, a campus physical master plan. This was really supposed to look at the campus after the strategic plan. So almost everything I'm going to show you in the next few slides comes directly from the strategic plan. But we also now have a vision for all of our geographic locations for the next 15 years uh, and how those things should look. But we've gone ahead and We've revitalized our research and academic spaces with new buildings on all of our campuses. Uh, there's a partial list of the new buildings that we built over those years. Some of these are smaller, some of these are really big, um, but up and running, and Tony delivers these on time and on budget, hopefully. These are the ones you've already done. You can take credit for these, right? Um, student spaces, whether it's honors colleges or dormitories or athletic facilities, Again, a partial list of the ones that have been done there. Um, health sciences spaces, we're just ramping up on this now. A lot of them are on the horizon in the next year or two as Brian starts to spend some of this money. Right, Brian? Mm -hmm. um, and here's what we've done in the last few years in these areas. Um, and of course, community spaces. We now have uh, alumni houses on each of our campuses. So our alumni community can feel more tied in. Uh, to where, where we are all the Put it in, in short, we've done about $2.6 billion worth of capital projects um, in the past, uh, since I bought here. Um, and that's not kind of the ones that are underway now, but the ones that are done and completed. Um, the other area that uh, we've been working hard on is changing the, the landscape and the hardscape. These are the things that you see when you walk around campus but don't necessarily uh, cost what a, a big building is, whether it's redoing College Avenue uh, with the bike lanes and the bus lanes, or it's putting in uh, the Paul Rosen Plaza, or it's putting um, uh, weather protection over our bus 
stops or the Hawker single crossing on George Street and College Avenue. And I can tell you, not boy, I, I haven't had one incident, I don't think, until I go on way, of uh, somebody being uh, run over one of those streets this year. That, that not this year. Now, well, well, that's huge. That, I think in the last two years since this was done, that's the first time since yeah. I got here that we haven't had it. So we can make progress on these things. Um, okay, so I just want to finish up on this note. A lot has changed in the last seven years. Now I'm going to take a, a little longer viewpoint. We started out in 2012 when I got here with about 58,000 students. We are now over 70,000 students. Uh, we gave out 13,900 degrees in 2012. We gave out almost 19,000 this year. Our budget back then, 1.9 billion, now over 4.3 billion. Our endowment has gone from 690 to 1.3 billion. Professorships, as I mentioned, I'm very happy with this, from 41 to 89. Those are the endowed professorships, plus the other 30 um, that we're uh, running out of operations. Fundraising, uh, new records, research <coughs> expenditure, new records, tuition kept low, capital construction, new records, Rutgers Health, non existent, pushing up towards 2 million patient counters now. And so, I think we have delivered on most of the points that you would find in that strategic plan. I couldn't possibly cover them all, but I can tell you, based on the slides I took out, so we get this done, that I can probably tell you for almost every point in the strategic plan uh, what we've actually done. We said that we were not generating a strategic plan to put on the shelf. That this wasn't a strategic plan in the sense looking 10, 20 years from now. It's a tactical plan. It was one that we were going to do in five years. Five years are up. So you should hold us responsible and accountable, um, but I think we can uh, take a good account of ourselves. We have a lot of challenges left. Uh, nobody's saying we're done by any means. Um, continued pressure on the budgets all around. Uh, we continue to, to work hard to make a one to one and a half percent operating margin on a business our size. Um, we still have to make sure we do all this while retaining and, and uh, attracting the most diverse students and keeping the price down. Um, we have to take care of this aging campus. So 2.5, 2.6 billion is just the first step in what has to be done around here. Um, and uh, there are a couple more down there that you can see uh, what we have to do. So it's a challenging environment. I think it, it's probably time for a relook at where the strategic plan is going to have to go. Uh, we've got a few things that we still need to do, uh, but it's been a good run. I think we've got a lot done. So I'm going to stop there. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. No questions. No questions. Total numbers. I think any any time a strategic plan results in activity and action is something to be commended. As you said, there are too many that just end up on the shelf. Aren't they lovely? People work very hard on them. But this is terrific. Because to see the outcome based on the plan is so encouraging. Thank you. Thank you. Mary, anyone else? I echo uh, Dorothy's comments. I, I just wanted to say the second to last chart that you showed us, 12 to 19, is really impressive um, in terms of the growth of students and programs, but also um, managing that tuition in a way that is, is below the average of prior years. And yet we have built, I noticed in particular, the, the capital construction is nearly at two and a half billion. And how is it that we've been able to do that? I know that you've yeah. carefully managed in terms of debt. So how have we been able to leverage other resources? Well, I think the key to the game is is controlling expenses. And we've been just relentless in taking expenses out of the operation every year. And Mike and the team can tell you about the number of hours they spend and the blood on the floor about taking another one and a half percent, another two percent of their operating budgets. <clears throat> but the, the, the Proof of the pudding is having the rating agencies come in and see that you've taken on all this additional debt and done all this building, but you're still able to service it with a business plan that's robust and you have levers to pull if you need to. So if they thought that we would, um, we were in a position where one or two things going wrong and we go south, we wouldn't be ready where we are. They recognize that the demand is there and it's increasing. They recognize that. Um, the research activity is growing. The research that are they understand that our tuition has been held low. If disaster hit, it could be raised. So there are lots of levers that could be pulled 
Um, and we intentionally keep it operating margin down where it is. So the key is diversification of revenue streams, increasing revenue from uh, non-traditional activity and from research and from philanthropy as we become, become less dependent on the state, which we have to do, and reducing operating expenses in a way that takes the burden off our units, giving them the tools to be entrepreneurial. That's what our CM is all about. I think that's kind of magic about it. Anyway. I have a question. Uh, to, <clears throat> this year is the, the first uh, graduating class for the Honors College. Yeah. So uh, we started uh, 528 students in the, uh, 2015. How many people graduated? What percentage? Uh, Barbara, you know that. Our, our graduation, this was now a four year graduation rate. Right? Yeah. So that's it. I think we were 86 or 85 percent graduated in four years, which is way above where uh, the average is for, for our six-year graduation rate, and above where honors colleges are. So we we're really glad about money. So kids that took a semester off and went abroad will graduate the next September uh, or uh, December. Don't count on that. Number. So they're all doing very well. And most of them stay in the, in the programs. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yes. Absolutely. The retention rate in that program. If I may, could you say a little bit about how things are going with Rutgers Future Scholars in terms of the graduation rate? We should have had one or two graduate classes. This is our second year, isn't it? For, I think last year was the first one in terms of bargaining. Uh, yes, last year was the first year because it's the program is 10 years old, but of course it starts when it's in eighth grade. So um, the, the graduation rate, I think, was in the 70s. Um, you know, they're they're students and they have life, particularly that group of students have life challenges, and, but they're, they're sticking around and we're working very hard to make them successful. These are kids from high schools where the high school graduation rate was 50%. Okay? All right. Thank you. Thanks for all <clears throat> Sciences 
who are both named in his honor. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Governors of Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, as an expression of the Board and the University in grateful remembrance of Stanley S. Bergen's dedication and service to the State of New Jersey and higher education, this memorial shall be recorded in the minutes of the Board of Governors, and be it further resolved that a copy of this memorial be sent to the Bergen family, along with the Board's heartfelt and deepest consultant. I so move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. <coughs> I'd like to call on uh, Bill Best to read a resolution recognizing Dudley Rivers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It will be an honor to do so. Dudley H. Rivers, Jr. Whereas your term on the Board of Governors come to a close on June 30th, 2019, and whereas you have steadfastly supported Rutgers since your first appointment as a Charter Trustee to the Board of Trustees in 2002, your reappointment as a Charter Trustee in 2013, as Vice Chair of the Board of Trustees from 2009 to 2011, as Chair of the Board of Trustees in 2013, and now as a member of the Board of Governors, and whereas a loyal son of Rutgers who selfishly lent your expertise and experience to the university during times of great change, staunchly upholding the values and mission of the university as you testified before the New Jersey State Legislature on the New Jersey Medical and Health Sciences Restructuring Act, and worked diligently and tirelessly to ensure the in in integration of the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey into Rutgers was successful, and whereas in continuing to ensure the success of the integration, you answered the call when the Board of Governors asked you to become a member of the Rutgers University Camden Board of Directors, ultimately assuming its chairmanship and proudly representing and advocating for your alma mater on the Rowan University Rutgers Camden Board of Governors to oversee the business and healthcare renaissance of Camden City and Whereas your passion, keen insight, and invaluable guidance have ins ensured Rutgers continues to maintain affordable tuition rates while providing world-class education. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Governors of Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, warmly and appreciatively thanks Dudley H. Rivers for his service to the Board of Governors, and be it further resolved that the members of the Board of Governors of Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, express their deepest gratitude and heartfelt thanks to Dudley H. Rivers for his distinguished service to the Rutgers University, the Board of Governors, and the Board of Trustees, and extend their warmest wishes for the future and look forward to his continued wisdom and guidance as a meritorious member of the Board of Trustees. Mr. Chair, I so move. Second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to thank this year's faculty and student representatives of the Board of Governors whose term will end in June. Uh, Professor Peter Gillett, who served as chair of the University Senate, faculty representative for the past three years, and whose report I always look forward to hearing. Not because it's the last report. <laughs>
All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. I'll back in as I please.
to become health information management for the same reasons. Next, he reported on two updates in credit requirements at the School of Public Health as PH, <coughs> one for the MS in Public Health degree for clinicians who will get a three credit reduction in their mandatory course load from 45 to 42 for their special training, and another to reduce the credit requirements for the MS in Physical Assistant degree program to accommodate changes in the first year basic science curriculum. Lastly, Mr. Andreessen informed the committee about two SPH standalone certificate programs. The first focusing on LGBTQ health, and the second with a focus on pharmacoepidemiology. He stated that these certificate programs are inducements to post baccalaureate students in their studies and encourages them to complete full degrees. Next, Rutgers University, New Brunswick Chancellor uh, Christopher Malloy reported on a new standalone horticultural therapy certificate that is offered by the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences to non-matriculated students, and that the changes in the required curriculum correspond to changes set up for accreditation by the American Horticultural Therapy Association. He also informed the committee that the School of Professional Psychology will offer a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology, Master of Applied Psychology, five-year degree, uh, degree program. Mr. Andreessen informed the committee that the RVHS School of Health Professions has proposed establishing a Master of Science in Speech Language Pathology degree program. The sixth semester, six to six credit course, plus clinical practicum, will prepare students for the diagnosis and treatment of communication disorders. The committee agreed to recommend to the Board of Governors for approval the resolution that appears on the consent agenda. Rutgers University in Newark Chancellor Nancy Cantor informed the committee that the Rutgers Business School RBS graduate program, Newark and New Brunswick, is proposing a two-year, 60-credit <coughs> Doctor of Business Administration degree program that will be offered in Newark in the evening and weekend hours. Following the discussion, the committee agreed to recommend to the Board of Governors for approval the resolution that also appears on the consent agenda. Next, the committee met an executive session to discuss recommendations for the 2018-2019 academic promotion cycle. Following the discussion, the committee agreed to recommend to the Board of Governors for approval certain academic appointments, promotions, and administrative appointments involving tenure under the consent agenda. Chancellor Nancy Cantor then presented the name of Dr. James Tepper as a Board of Governors Professor of Molecular and Behavioral Neuroscience. The committee agreed to recommend to the Board of Governors for approval the resolution under the consent agenda. Chancellor Nancy Cantor also presented Professor John C. Dubin, a professor of law who has served nearly 20 years on the Rutgers Newark faculty for consideration as a distinguished service professor. The committee agreed to endorse the recommendation and pass on to the Board of Governors for approval the resolution under the consent agenda. And finally, the committee agreed to recommend to the Board of Governors for approval the following resolution, naming Professor Peter Lowe as a distinguished service <coughs> professor. If I may, Mr. Chairman, whereas the nomination of Professor Peter Lowe to be named a Distinguished Service Professor by Denis Paré, Acting Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences, Newark, has been endorsed by Nancy Cantor, Chancellor of Rutgers University, Newark, and Barbara A. Lee, Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, and approved by Robert L. Barchi, President of the University. And whereas Professor Lowe has been acclaimed for his publicly engaged scholarship which has had national policy implications and has increased public understanding of the determinants of transportation accidents, including his expert testimony in judicial proceedings and before United States Congressional Committees, the New Jersey Assembly Judiciary Committee, and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, and as evidenced by his appointment to the Committee for the Safety Belt Technology Study of the Transportation Research Board, a division of the National Academy of Sciences. And whereas Professor Lowe has been recognized for his service as executive board member and president of the Transportation and Public Utilities Group, which awarded him the coveted Distinguished Medal Member Award, 
His work at Rutgers Newark as chair of the Department of Economics and director of the Ridewood Program in Economics. His over 20 years of service to the Rutgers University Research Council, serving as chair of the council from 2007 to 2010. His effort as associate director of the Office of Research and Sponsored Programs and his generosity in sharing his expertise with educators, advisory committees, and government agencies in the service of transportation safety. And whereas on June 5, 2019, the Committee on Academic and Student Affairs of the Board of Governors endorsed the naming of Peter Vogue as Board of Governors Distinguished Service Professor and recommended approval by the Board of Governors. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Governors of Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, names Peter Lowe as a Distinguished Service Professor, effective June 19, 2019. Mr. Chairman, I so move. Any second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <coughs> Motion carries. Thank you. Dr. Campbell, do you want to say a few words? Wherever you'd like. <laughs> it's, it's just a real thank you. It's a great honor to, to be able to introduce and celebrate Peter Loeb, a phenomenal member of Rutgers for over 50 years, starting as an undergraduate at Rutgers Newark in Economics, going on to get his doctorate at Rutgers New Brunswick, and coming back, thank goodness, to Rutgers Newark um, to both chair the Department of Economics and serve on, on enormous numbers of committees. When I started asking people about Peter, the thing they always talked about was those many, many hours of informal mentoring and teaching that have really changed the trajectory of so many students over all that time. He is a true son of Newark and really understands um, both the, the value of our students and what they can do. And you have heard from Mr. Roper's resolution that he has done enormous work on public transportation safety. Every time I at least get in a car and every time you do, you should be grateful that Peter is testifying and using econometrics to really change the nature of what it means to have um, transportation safety, everything from safe, safety belts to um, thinking about speed limits and inspections, looking at the effect of cell phones, and just a phenomenal um, expert, really distinguishes himself as a major, major figure for us, for the nation, um, and for all the students. So, thank you. Thank, thank you, Jane. Safety Program Plan for 2019, 
dated March 2019. These four matters were endorsed by the committee and will be moved under the consent agenda. Dr. Ganazi provided a brief overview of the minutes from the EPHC executive leadership meetings and reviewed important topics discussed at these meetings, including two grants received from the Nicholson Foundation, a new child and adolescent partial hospitalization program on the Piscataway campus, and an upcoming leadership forum hosted at Rutgers that will include 70 CEOs, COOs, and CFOs from across behavioral health care. Dr. Ganazi also detailed improvement in the no-show rates, which went from 68% to 27% over the last six months. Truly a remarkable shift as well as new services to provide peer-to-peer -peer support for Medicaid patients with addiction disorders. Next, Dr. Martin Blay is the director of the Center for Advanced Biotechnology and Medicine and Chancellor Scholar began his presentation with an introduction of the microbiome, am I saying it right? Good. Good. <laughs> Explaining the unique characteristics of the microbiome and the microbes contained in it. He reviewed many chronic diseases that have increased over recent decades and discussed his theories on why these types of diseases have been increasing so rapidly. He then outlined the theory he developed, which asserts that changing human ecology has altered transmission and maintenance of ancestral microbes, which affects the composition of the microbiota. He spoke about the various stages of antibiotic exposure that impact the bacteria in the gut, as well as the way the microbiome impacts organs throughout the body, and offered solutions to the loss of diversity within the microbiome. And yesterday, it was announced that Dr. Glazer was chosen to receive the 2019 Robert Koch Gold Medal for Contribution to Medicine Award, a very impressive member of our faculty. <coughs> then Dr. Daniel Horton, Director of the Center for Advanced Biotechnology and Medicine, provided the committee a presentation regarding the origins of childhood arthritis and discussed studies currently underway to examine the link between antibiotics and juvenile idiopathic arthritis and whether the imbalance in the microbiome can trigger juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Through his research, he determined <coughs> that children who developed it were more likely to have received antibiotics and more courses of antibiotics, particularly within one or two years of their diagnosis. Truly important research. <coughs> Dr. Brian Strom, Chancellor for Rector's Biomedical and Health Sciences and Executive Vice President for Health Affairs, provided an RBHS progress report <coughs> me, for fiscal year 19 including key leadership appointments and new searches currently underway. He specifically reviewed the, the appointment of, of Dr. M. Bashir Omari, who recently accepted the position of Senior Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs and Research, noting that he is an international leader in gastrointestinal biology and physiology, and the incoming president of the American Gastroenterological Association for 2021. 2020 to 2020. Dr. Strong also provided an update on fundraising for RBHS, highlighting a record annual fundraising total with two months to go on the fiscal year. And he highlighted the New, York, the, the New Jersey Center on Gun Violence Research at Rutgers University, which is only one of two research centers focused on studying gun violence in the whole country. Dr. Strom then provided a federal funding update, noting that the Cancer, Cancer Institute of New Jersey, CINJ, received its redesignation as New Jersey's only National Cancer Institute, um, designated Comprehensive Cancer Center. Chancellor Strom also highlighted the Rutgers RWJ Campus <coughs> Rising Stars Program, reviewing the RBHS media impact to date and concluded his presentation by reviewing fiscal year 19 goals. Ms. Kathleen Brownwell, Senior Vice Chancellor of Finance Administration, provided an RBHS financial update. Ms. Brownwell provided a brief preview into the fiscal year 19 budget compared to the fiscal 
I'm sorry, 1519 projection compared to the fiscal year 19 budget, as well as a preview of the fiscal year 20 budget. Finally, Dr. Vicente Gracia, Senior Vice Chancellor for Clinical Affairs of our EHS, provided an update on Rutgers Health Group. He began with a review of the clinical practice integration and then discussed the two-day off-site Rutgers Health Chairs retreat, noting that it was very successful, and discussed the most critical core principles and cross-cutting issues that need to be recognized, understood, and addressed for collaboration with our WJ Barnabas Health to be successful. Dr. Grassi has also provided an update on the education integration with our WJBH, speaking specifically about successes in the merging of St. Barnabas and New Jersey Medical School graduate med medical education programs. Dr. Grassi has then moved on to other health affairs initiatives and reviewed the relationship between Rutgers Health and the New Jersey Office of Veterans Affairs. The progress made on the university's influenza immunization policy and other student health strategic priorities. Dr. Gracias concluded his report by reviewing the Rutgers Health Group key performance indicators. And that concludes my report, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dorothy. I'd like to call Ms. Gallery for the report on the audit committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Committee on Audit met on Wednesday, May 8th, from 9 to 12. Ms. Kimberly Paswa, Secretary of the University, provided an overview of the University's conflict of interest policy and explained the required disclosures. She reported that the governing boards were in compliance for the current year. Ms. Shelley Massey, KPMG Lead Audit Engagement Partner, and her colleague presented a summary of the final fiscal 2018 audit deliverables completed since the last meeting. She then provided an overview of the fiscal 2019 audit planning and progress made to date on the engagement. The overview included the audit objective, areas of risk, timeline, and approach. Her colleague also discussed new Gatsby regulations related to the fiscal 19 that may impact the university. Mr. J. Michael Gower, Executive Vice President for Finance and Administration and University Treasurer, then provided an update on cornerstone initiatives. Specifically, he discussed the selection of a new student information systems vendor, the movement towards a one-stop shop, model for student services, and the planning for implementing the new Oracle Cloud HR payroll system. Dr. Timothy Fournier, Senior Vice President and Chief Enterprise Risk Management, Ethics, and Compliance Officer, provided an update activities with University Ethics and Compliance, UBC, including a structural change in the organization where audit and advisory services now reports to him. He summarized the institutional compliance activities in the areas of research, athletics, and healthcare, and highlighted activities reported through the University Compliance Hotline. Dr. Fournier also provided an update on the next phase of the Enterprise Risk Management since hiring a new Enterprise Risk Management Manager. Ms. Ruth Bilo, Chief Executive Chief Audit Executive presented three audit reports to the committee, as well as the results of four recently completed investigations, one of which had a substantial, a substantiated allegation. Ms. Philo also discussed her department's continuous monitoring data analytics program, progress towards meeting departmental goals, and follow-up efforts for monitoring the implementation of past recommendations. The committee then met in executive session with KPMG, UEC, and general counsel and then separately with UEC, UEC, AAS, and the committee itself. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thank you, Heather. Uh, I'd like to now call on Mr. Anderson to give the report on the uh, financial facilities committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We had a busy meeting. I'll be as brief as I can. Mr. Calcato uh, gave background information on the proposed resolution amending original July 18, 2018 project resolution approving uh, the redevelopment of 155 Washington Street, Rutgers University, Newark. Uh, after considerable study, the administration concluded that the best option for the university would be an outright sale of the property. Proceeds of the sale, as outlined by Chancellor Cantor, would be added to philanthropic funds to provide scholarships for Newark resident students. Mr. Chair, the resolution authorizing the sale is in the consent agenda and is under tab N. Mr. Calcato introduced the proposed resolution approving the sale of surplus land uh, in Edison Township. The 
administration periodically reviews its land holdings and fiscal assets to determine the highest and best use. Uh, this parcel, originally a part of Camp Kilman, deeded to the university at no cost in the mid-1960s and later bifurcated from the Livingston campus by the realignment of Cedar Lane has been deemed insignificant and surplus. The university entered into negotiations to sell and monetize this asset for the purpose of adding to the quasi-endowment. Mr. Chair, the resolution authorizing the sale is on the consent agenda and is under tab O. Mr. Chair, I don't have the bond resolution for which there are conflicts. Yeah, um, the next is the bond resolution and we have two members of the board who have stated previous con uh, conflicts of interest. I'll ask Mr. Banks and Mr. Huntley to leave the room. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Gower and Assistant Treasurer Day presented the proposed resolution authorizing Rutgers the State University of New Jersey to enter into a supplemental indenture of trust and certain other agreements in connection with the issuance by the University of one or more series of tax-exempt or federally taxable general obligation bonds and to take other action in connection therewith. Mr. Gower explained that in a recent review of the University's debt portfolio, the finance staff and the financial advisors concluded that the University should accelerate the issuance of bonds to take advantage of the very favorable market conditions, replacing a sale uh, that would uh, typically uh, not uh, occur until uh, next year. Uh, this proposal uh, provides new debt funds to finance projects that are already under construction, like the HLLC building, the ERP system upgrades, uh, and other high priority projects. The administration was asked to consider the total amount of the issuance given the favorable market. Uh, upon review of this analysis, the committee endorsed this resolution authorizing should the market conditions permit the following structure. Up to $330 million in new, bond, new money bonds, tax exempt and taxable bonds, including refinancing at a fixed rate, $150 million of outstanding commercial paper, and $21.8 million of refunding bonds from 2010, if sufficient savings are achieved. Mr. Chair, I move the resolution included under tab E. Can I get a second? Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carried. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Gower then reviewed the proposed amendment to the bylaws of the Board of Governors regarding the review of disbursements of funds greater than $250,000. Since the bylaws first were adopted, technology and disbursement mechanisms have changed dramatically, and the administration proposed a revision that incorporates a two-part control process for discretionary payments greater than a million dollars at the time an invoice is processed, regardless of the payment mechanism. In addition, Mr. Gower recommended removal of the obsolete requirement for the Executive Vice President for Finance and Administration and the University Treasurer to hold a surety bond. The Secretary is proposing other updates uh, to clean up language uh, in other areas of bylaws. I should say that in respect of the so the surety bond there is uh, uh, overlapping insurance in place, so we would, we would otherwise be paying double. Mr. Chair, this resolution is on the consent agenda uh, from the Executive Committee. Finally, Mr. Gower presented two proposed resolutions adopting a statement of intent to confirm financial assurance for decommissioning activities related to Rutgers licenses for radioactive materials. The Board of Governors must periodically adopt as a standard requirement statements that the university will approve funding for any decommissioning activities associated with radioactive materials with operations authorized under New Jersey De uh, Department of Environmental Protection Material Licenses. Mr. Chair, this resolution is on the consent agenda and is under tab P. Uh, there were then uh, three brief matters for information. Mr. Calcato provided an overview of the honors living learning community facility at Rutgers University Newark, including <coughs> extensive and respectful process of disinterment, 335 cents of remains found at the site of the uh, reinterment uh, of, at uh, the Hollywood Cemetery. Uh, he also discussed the Department of Transportation plans to replace the landing lane bridge in New Brunswick. Ms. Detloff shared an update on progress for the fiscal year 2020 budget that will come to the committee uh, and to, to this board uh, in July. Uh, Dr. Barton
overarching, Mr. Gower gave us a synopsis of the uh, third quarter fiscal year 2019 university metrics, highlighting strong results for academic enrollment, research, and clinical activity, Mr. Chairman. That concludes my report. Thank you. Yes. Are there any items that members of this board wish to remove from the consent agenda? Hearing none, upon recommendation of the Committee on Academic and Student Affairs, the Executive Committee, the Committee on Finance and Facilities, and the Committee on Health Affairs, I move that the board approve the items contained in the consent agenda. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? steadfastly making decisions with an eye towards the best interest of our members. And whereas you have dedicated enormous amounts of time and resources to benefit Rutgers having served as vice chair and then chair of the Board of Trustees during an era of great change and times of turmoil. As vice chair of the Board of Governors and now as chair of the Board of Governors. Whereas you worked tirelessly to foster greater cohesion amongst the members of the Board of Governors improving communication and boosting the efficacy and efficiency of the Board of Governors and the Governor's Executive Committee. And whereas your passion, invaluable guidance, and leadership are an inspiration and a model to all follow. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Governors of Rutgers State University of New Jersey warmly and appreciatively thanks Sandy J. Stewart for his service to the Board as Chairman, and be it further resolved that Sandy J. Stewart will continue to enjoy our highest esteem as he continues as a member of the Board of Governors. Uh, I shall move that. Second. Second. Any objections? Any comments? The resolution is passed. We have a leather ground. Dr. 
Gillett, report on the University Senate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, everyone. Please do feel, uh, if you wish, uh, able to take the opportunity to be delighted because uh, notwithstanding any other redeeming characteristics this report may have, and notwithstanding the previous remarks of the Chair, it nevertheless is and shall be our final report on the agenda today. <laughs> the Executive Committee plans the business of the Senate, considering and uh, issuing charges to committees, receiving reports and docketing them for full Senate debate. The Executive Committee has met twice since the last Board of Governors meeting. On April the 12th, we met as usual in New Brunswick. The 2019-2020 schedule of item submission deadlines was circulated and two new charges were issued uh, to Senate committees relating to considering what changes, if any, in Rutgers policy on workplace violence are appropriate and considering and recommending appropriate policy changes relating to the role and status of faculty councils at Rutgers, both of which I expect you will hear from the Senate on in the course of time. The Executive Committee met for the final time this academic year on Friday, June the 7th. The Chair confirmed that the Senate has now submitted four names to Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, Barbara Lee, for the Chancellor Review Committee for Chancellor Strong, and eight names for the Evaluation Committee for University Library and Chris Ellen Maloney. Membership and chairs of Senate committees were discussed, together with the formation of next year's University Commencement Panel, both of which are scheduled to be finalized at the next <coughs> meeting. Four new charges were issued relating to recommending norms for teaching loads at Rutgers and making recommendations regarding how such norms are implemented and followed in practice. Considering possible changes to the standard time limit for Senate meetings and making appropriate recommendations for such changes. Considering potential changes to the composition of the Senate and considering possible improvements to our policy and processes for selection of recipients of honorary degrees and commencement speakers. The main work of the Senate is carried out by its other committees and panels. At present, those committees have before them 16 pending charges, including only four of the 17 that are reported to you this time last year, in addition to their standing charges. Details are available online. The Rutgers University Senate 2018-2019 met for the final time on May the 3rd when it received a report from the Instruction Curriculum Advising Committee on complementary credentialing and digital badges for Rutgers University, adopted a resolution on issues related to the progress of Rutgers as a leading research institution, which was proposed on behalf of the Executive Committee, and received an administrative report from Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, Barbara Lee. Details of Senate reports and resolutions are also available online. Immediately prior to this meeting, the Rutgers University Senate 2019-2020 held its initial meeting on May 3rd, at which time it elected officers, executive committee members and board representatives. The new chair will be Senator John Oliver, a staff member who is currently serving as vice chair. This will be the first time in the history of the Rutgers University Senate uh, that it has been chaired by a staff member. Uh, I, for my sins, which you will remember from last year's report, are many and egregious, uh, shall be serving as his vice chair, final evidence that my career is now over the hill, and I'm proceeding downwards. Uh, full details of the election results are available online at, um, at the, the Senate's website. The new executive committee meets for the first time on September the 6th, 2019, and the 2019-2020 Senate meets again on September the 20th. Therefore, I do not anticipate there being anything to report at the next meeting of the Board of Governors, and if I have lied, it shall not be my problem. <laughs> this concludes my report and my reports. Thank you very much. Is there any old business? A new business. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. How about a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed?